terrorist bombings and invasion to stop. And yet, I, I sorry, and yet I am convinced. Um, I am convinced that for us who are not below the bombs, we have a duty to think and organize beyond the scale of time of the ceasefire and to reach the scale of time of liberation and to think and organize beyond the scale of space, space that is Gaza to reach the scale of, pay, of space of the whole Palestine and even the world. As, as, uh, as we've wrote in our statement for the Funambulist uh, uh, in the three weeks ago, we would like that's just a short excerpt. We would like all of us to understand that the powerlessness so many of us have been feeling these past couple of weeks is what we are doomed to feel year after year if the massive, beautiful impetus of solidarity for a free Palestine only happens during the most murderous, most spectacular form of Israeli settler colonial violence. We would like all of us to understand that if this impetus were to be sustained in time, months after the dreadful return to what many will call normal, normal being a more swallowable reality where only the slow mundane daily violence is at work, the international support Palestinians have been generously nurturing for decades will have an actual chance to contribute to decolonization. Um, I'll go to it in just a second, but I realized I just wanted to say a little bit quote unquote, from where I'm speaking. So uh, as uh, Sheriff uh, generously uh, introduced, I am the editor in chief and the founder of uh, the magazine, The Funambulist, uh, that some of you might be uh, familiar with, some of you might not. Uh, I think my dear colleague, Shivangi Mariam Raj, who's our head of communication, would uh, be mad at me if I would not encourage you all to subscribe uh, while, uh, while I have you <laughs> listening. Uh, and uh, and then as the work that I will talk about today is a little bit closer to my own personal uh, research as an architect and, and personal engagement for, for Palestine, uh, for the liberation of Palestine. And it mostly was crystallized in those two books that Sheriff also uh, quoted, uh, Weaponized Architectures, the Impossibility of Innocence, that was uh, written in 2010. And uh, the bulldozer politics, the Palestinian ruin as an Israeli um, project that was published in 2016. Uh, if I'm being quite honest, I think that you know it's they were written a long time ago. So I feel that I I have a different I have a slightly more precise perspective on the matter now. But uh, I guess we we all have to to work towards making our perspective a little bit sharper throughout the year. So that's what I'm dedicated to do. Uh, if I continue my my small uh, written introduction uh, and put us back very much in the topic that is at hand today, um, something that I should say also is that it's, this is like, this is a, the one sort of quote unquote theoretical slide of the presentation. Everything else will be very, much more on the documentary side of things and also very much calibrated for an architecture student uh, audience. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm of course aware that out of the 8,000 people who registered to the presentation, many of them might not be architecture students and many of them might actually know relatively well as uh, a topic uh, at, uh, at hand here. And so, but, you know, I think for me, it was important to almost go back to the basics, so to speak. And um, and so talk to an audience who perhaps uh, need a little bit of, uh, of catching up, so to speak. Um, something else I can say is that every document I'm showing today, I have, I have 170 slides, by the way, so brace yourself. <laughs> uh, we're going to be together for about two hours, but, uh, 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 and I'll try for, you know, I'll try not to spend an, an entire minute on each slide. Of course, that would be excruciating, but uh, just, just so you know. And all of those slides are my own documents, um, whether uh, maps or photos. And the reason I do that is, I guess, for consistency, um, because you'll see, I think there's there's a sort of photographic and cartographic consistencies, a, a sort of graphic consistency that I believe makes the presentation a little bit stronger. Um, also, because for me, it's quite it's 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 often important to um, reduce 
uh, the reduced to only one degree of separation, the separation between you, the viewers, and the document, the photo or the map. And this only degree of separation between you and the and the document is is me essentially. It's not it's not uh, mediated through anything else. So I I think that um, that's also something that might be useful, especially um, especially in the context of Palestine. Um, and then you will see that every every one of those documents is dated, uh, which I think also allows you to follow a little bit. Uh, the last 15 years of evolution uh, uh, of the situation in Palestine through my own eyes, which of course is an extremely subjective uh, uh, perspective, but but yet it is it is one that um, uh, you know <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's uh, I think I think it goes back to this idea of consistency. So I'll I'll, I'll read just a, a little bit more and then I'll I'll go back to a more organic presentation. Settler colonialism essentially consists in occupying as much land as possible and push out indigenous uh, nations who were not cleansed into overly controlled militarized reservations. It is therefore not surprising that architecture is settler colonialism's best friend. Nothing easier for architecture to embody and therefore enforce the settler colonial lines traced by the occupying power, as we will see today. Architecture is not a neutral discipline that can be used to do good or bad, good or bad. It is a political weapon, and like most weapons, it serves more eagerly the regimes of domination and their police. But every now and then, it also provides advantageous spatial conditions for revolutionary struggles to deploy themselves. May our work as architects humbly contribute to those while never indulging with the others. All right. So that's it for the slightly more formal. Uh, so let's get to it with uh, with actually some of the most uh, basic things, which is that when we talk about Palestine, we're talking about that land over here. Uh, and um, and that includes uh, that includes a sort of three distinct territories that uh, uh, splits Palestine whether it's Gaza, uh, the West Bank, or what Palestinians called 48 Palestine, which is essentially uh, the land, the, the land uh, of, of Israel today, of the Israeli state, of the Israeli state. Um, and to also sort of explain how those three territories came, came to be, we have to go back to the 1948 Nakba, uh, the catastrophe and the 1967 Naxa, the setback, uh, and those maps are trying to address that. Um, the little, so the 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 land, um, uh, the land in gray here um, that uh, is usually known as as uh, the, as as Israel, as 48 Palestine is. Um, you can see those little white dots, which are essentially hundreds of Palestinian villages that uh, in the months preceding uh, 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 the establishment of the state of Israel, and I think it's very important to say in the months preceding, uh, meaning that during the British colonial occupation of Palestine, it uh, uh, Zionist paramilitary groups uh, practiced the ethnic cleansing of, of, that, of, the, of the territory, uh, evicted all those villages, destroyed them, and uh, displaced over 750,000 uh, Palestinians from from their land who who then became refugees in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and then formed the more at large the the the, the large uh, Palestinian diaspora around the world. Um, so you can see those villages there that you will find also in uh, in uh, in the next map. Um, the West Bank and Gaza uh, from 1948 to 1967 were uh, under, uh, respectively, Jordanian and Egyptian uh, administration, and then came uh, came the 1967 uh, invasion uh, during June of 1967 of the Israeli army, uh, who took who took over East Jerusalem and the West Bank, uh, the Gaza, Gaza Strip, the entire Sinai Peninsula, as you can see on the on the left map in Egypt. And then the Jolan, the Jolan, the Golan Heights in uh, in Syria that uh, Israel still occupies today, on the top north uh, of of Palestine, 
uh, outside of Palestine. I think it's important to say I've seen many, I've seen many maps of Palestine in the last few days where that includes the Go the Jordan as part of the revolutionary map of Palestine of a future Palestine. And I think uh, the Jordan belongs to Syria, so it's important we we take it out of our maps in our in our liberatory future, so to speak. Uh, if you allow me to move the north uh, from the top of the map to the right of the map, so that we can, um, so that it's easier to deal with our horizontal uh, uh, horizontal format, uh, this map is trying to be a, a comprehensive map, or well, comprehensive, comprehensive yet not exhaustive, of course, far from it. Um, map of the various uh, the various architectural apparatuses of uh, Israeli settler colonialism in. Palestine, including uh, the Bedouin villages in the Nakab uh, desert, so the, the desert in the south of Palestine, uh, the Bedouin villages uh, that are uh, regularly destroyed by the Israeli army. So those are the little uh, black and white dots here. I mean, they're pretty small. Um, the villages, fr villages from the Nakba, uh, as you can see, uh, that are the ones that were in white in the previous map. Um, the various Israeli colonies within the West Bank, but also in 48 Palestine as well, uh, that you can see in purple, um, and uh, and more generally various uh, various apparatus, architectural apparatuses that will will go one by one throughout the presentation. So I'll, I'll go back to this map for quite a bit. And then you also have uh, South Lebanon here uh, that was occupied uh, from the beginning of. As uh, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1992, all the way to 2000. So for uh, those uh, who, those of you uh, who are, belong to my generation, you probably remember uh, uh, you probably remember that. Um, so let's start with um, with Gaza, which I should say, and hopefully it's not too disappointing but is probably the smallest part of this presentation because, as I say, it was important for me to speak with my own perspective and uh, with my own documents. And uh, it just so happens that I've never been allowed to get into Gaza, so I've never I've never actually been, so I don't have any photos of the architectural apparatuses at work, but uh, I worked on a few maps, including in the summer of 2014, that same thing, like people were maybe uh, not not overly young uh, right now remember as a as another absolutely dreadful time where we just couldn't sleep anymore thinking of uh with so many people within gaza who were being bombed and invaded by the israeli army in 2014 um and so that's that's a map that i had made back then to show uh how um how the gaza strip is being uh is um, has its own um, architectural apparatus of occupation and a particularly violent one, one that you know uh, allows us to sometimes to to say that Gaza is the biggest uh, prison on earth, which you know sometimes is also something that is a little bit complicated to say because uh, it's also a place of life. It's also a place where people uh, uh, are in love, where people live and uh, and uh, so to call it the biggest prison on earth i mean i suppose in in prison also prisoners uh, manage to find a way to live uh, um, despite uh, the the horrible conditions in which they live but i uh, i personally never really embrace that metaphor of the biggest prison on earth but the reason why some people would say that is because uh, uh, gaza is literally surrounded by a, a blockade um a blockade uh, architectural uh, apparatus, which essentially consists in a wall um, uh, as well as various zones uh, uh, that creates the width of the wall, so to speak, where uh, people are being uh, quite literally shot at when they when they penetrate it. And that's something I had, you know, I told you it's a 2014 map, but I had done like a very, very small update in 2018 during the um during the the march of return uh, of uh, Palestinian Gazans uh, walking towards uh towards the wall and being shot at by his snipers um uh, so th those are the little black arrows you can see um and then the sea itself is being um 
is being uh, sealed uh, by um, by the Israeli Navy. Uh, it's written six nautical mile as a limit here, and I, I drew it to scale. So this is this is essentially as far as um, various Palestinian ships in uh, boats, in particular uh, uh, fishermen boats, uh, can can go without being uh, without being uh, destroyed. Uh, and sometimes this um, this limit is actually brought to a much closer uh, much closer to the shore. And I actually should have checked, but I I would not be surprised that right now it's actually the case that we are we might be down to three nautical miles, or or perhaps not even zero. Um, and then on the on the south side of the of the of the Gaza Strip. Uh, the Egyptian border usually uh, brings absolutely no solace whatsoever um, to Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, there was a small exception uh, when Morsi was uh, ru ru ruling uh, ruling Egypt in um, between 2011 to 2013. But both Mubarak and Sisi have been absolutely ruthless in their in in the ways that they. Um, uh, didn't provide it. I mean, provide any any sort of assistance to Palestinian people in Gaza. Um, and perhaps if we go well, and those are other maps that I had made in 2014, and that, that I think still applies today, which shows very much how uh, the Israeli army, in in its sort of genocidal effort, is and and in, and in the way of being sort of um, of of. Um, Allowing it to to de to to deploy its violence without being necessarily, uh, we, while deploying also a sort of a sort of uh, legal language uh, that seemed to justify uh, the seems to make lawful uh, uh, the, the the killing of so many Palestinians. They sort of invent their own rule of the game, including the one in twenty fourteen to increase. The no go zone from 100 meters to the uh, next to the wall uh, to three kilometers, as you can see, making the entire zone of this three kilometers offset from the wall uh, like a, a just three, like like a like a zone in which any person who basically uh, is uh, lives or stays. Uh, can be can keep can be killed because has been warned not to be in that zone and that's exactly what the Israeli army did this year as well uh, with in that case having the entire north half of the Gaza Strip as being like a zone in which people are considered to have been warned uh, uh, and therefore can be can be killed without without uh, uh, without sort of any legal complications so to speak. Uh, and of course, we know that the the rest of of the strip uh, in that in, in currently the, the southern part is is uh, barely any safer anyway. But what what it allowed to do is to actually again in twenty twenty three in twenty fourteen already, but in twenty three in an in even more drastic way because again, like just think of basically this entire part of Gaza being in the in the area that is considered as being bombable if you allow me for this horrible word um and uh and in and and basically in doing so allowed for a million and a half palestinians to be displaced from their home and and uh, brought brought back to the south brought to the south in a way that is very uh that is also trying to i mean that that very very much fail to dissimulate the, the ambition of the Israeli state, which is to evict uh, most Gazans, if not all Palestinians of Gaza, uh, to Egypt and to create an, another Nakba. Um, if we do focus on this, on this very, on, on the most southern part of Gaza, so if so, basically the the area here that is very close from the Egyptian border. Uh, some things that I had been um, trying to do a few years after, well, just a, a year after that, is to look at this very area and see, in particular, uh, see how the the sort of the layer of history um, of this particular area, which uh, is the south part of uh, a town, or it's the middle of a town called Rafa, which actually has a part um, in in Gaza and a part in Egypt, and was was cut. 
uh, by the by the border by the, the colonial border, um, and uh, and how those historical layers inform us about the various degree layers of destruction that the Israeli state have been um, uh, implementing on on Palestinian homes. Uh, in particular, in 1971. Uh, Ariel Sharon, who you might remember as uh, former prime minister of Israel, uh, in particular during the Second Intifada, uh, but used to be like a general of the Israeli army and the one in charge of the Gaza Strip in the uh, in the years that followed the invasion of the Gaza Strip uh, that followed 1967. Um, so uh, Sharon, influenced by uh, many other colonial wars, in particular uh, the French the French counter revolution in Algeria, knew that uh, Palestinian refugee camps, and we'll get to it at the very very end of the of the talk, of the teaching. Um, uh, pa Palestinian refugee camps are areas that are actually the most dangerous for uh, the occupying army um, because of of its um, you know very dense and very sinuous and and uh, uh, areas uh, where Palestinian fighters actually can fight the Israeli army despite the, 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 the incredible asymmetry uh, of power that is at stake. And so uh, Sharon ordered the destruction of 2,500 Palestinian homes in 1971, and in particular dig, uh, dug, sorry, um, um, like instead of the small uh, space between each uh, building of the Palestinian uh, refugee camps, had bulldozers digging uh, what later would be called the, the Sharon Boulevard by Palestinians. And the boulevard here refer to the way in Paris, uh, where I am right now, um, uh, the Haussmann, the prefect of Paris during Napoleon III's uh, rule. Uh, created like entire um, very large avenues within the city, within proletarian working class neighborhoods that tended to uh, foment insurrections uh, to to very much uh, split those neighborhoods into several parts and to be able to bring uh, the army uh, in a much more efficient way to 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 counter those insurrections. And so Sharon did the same in 1971. Then in, 1990, in 1982, um, when uh, Israel reluctantly uh, left the Sinai Peninsula after being defeated uh, by the Egyptian army, um, the Israeli state uh, destroyed another few hundreds of Palestinian homes along the border to create what is called the Palestinian, uh, the, sorry, the Philadelphia Corridor um, here that basically is, a, is, a, is another um, no go zone uh, along the, along the border. Um, during the second intifada, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I, I had like much closer uh, look at things. Uh, you can see how uh, here the there used to be the the airport uh, Yasser Arafat airport that actually lasted only for a, a little bit less than two years and was completely destroyed during the counter-revolution, the Israeli counter-revolution of the Second Intifada. And indeed, during the Second Intifada, the the, um, uh, the Israeli army destroyed another 2,500 uh, 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 Palestinian homes with those massive Caterpillar D9 armored uh, bulldozers. Um, and then there used to be also settlements, Israeli colonies within the Gaza Strip. Uh, there, was, there used to be 21 colonies uh, in the Gaza Strip, and then it was destroyed. They were, uh, um, they were uh, uh, um, emptied and destroyed uh, in 2005, uh, following a change of strategy from the Israeli state. That, and the strategy is, of course, the one that allows them to bomb uh, Gaza uh, uh, whenever they see fit, and that's it. Started relatively early after that in uh, in 20, 2018. You might remember in December twenty eighteen, January twenty twenty nine was the first massive bombing operation in the Gaza Strip. So as I said, like the, the part on Gaza is, is the lightest one of this presentation, whereas this one is going to be the longest one, um, uh, uh, which is dedicated to the West Bank and Jerusalem that we can call Al-Quds as well and the Arabic name. Um, and so if we focus specifically on that part of the map, uh, then uh, we can see 
uh, well, I guess we will start with the Israeli colonies themselves. So all those um, all those uh, uh, purple uh, areas here that are homes of over 800,000 uh, Israeli settlers, uh, perhaps more now that the construction have been uh, have been uh, pushed. Uh, and um, uh, what did I mean to say? Sorry. Uh, yeah, and, and that are actually, uh, I mean, you know, I don't talk much about international laws. This is not exactly the paradigm that I'm that I'm sort of eager to follow, but just just for those of you who perhaps have a little, perhaps a uh, higher degree of trust towards the international legislation, uh, those 800,000 settlers are essentially living in places that are in violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention from 1949 that essentially states that no occupying power of a given territory can um, transfer part of its civil population uh, uh, to, to this occupied territory. So, um, so if we look specifically at, 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 um, at those, um, this is a map that I had made like a, a very long time ago, but that, uh, that are called uh, the Palestinian Archipelago. Um, which I had done quite intuitively, but I, it just so happens that uh, a French, another French uh, person, uh, Julien Boussac, an artist, had uh, created a, a map even earlier than that, uh, also called the Palestinian Archipelago, and that is um, essentially uh, trying to metaphorically to show a metaphorical West Bank in which uh, the areas determined by uh, the Oslo Accord from 1993. Uh, um, those areas that you see here in like in in white and yellow are the areas called A and B in the sort of uh, again international legislation uh, nomenclature, um, which are the areas on which the newly formed after the the Oslo Accord the newly formed Palestinian Authority would have a relative um, a relative uh, um, sovereignty on on them. Um, and well, in in the fact, we realize it's absolutely not true because uh, we can see the we've seen like this this entire past year the Israeli army in, invading Nablus, invading Jenin in the north, uh, but also invading Ramallah. Um, so the Israeli uh, army comes and go uh, no matter what anyway. But you can see that those areas that are sort of given a certain degree of uh, slight degree of Palestinian autonomy are totally separated from 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 each other forming therefore this sort of metaphorical archipelago um and therefore the movement between those different islands is uh by definition totally controlled by uh the israeli army um and then you can see those in this sort of israeli sea of control like this sort of like light blue um metaphorical sea you can see those dark blue uh areas which are uh the israeli colonies in the west bank um, so, yeah, so as I said, like the movement between the different islands is totally controlled by the Israeli army. So that that's basically one of the uh, one of the checkpoints, what it looks like to be able to control uh, movement. So this checkpoint is between Ramallah and Birzeit, well, and the north of the West Bank in general. But in particular, if you are a student at the University of Birzeit, which is a pretty big university in the West Bank and and um, also uh, historically one of the key sites of Palestinian uh, uh, resistance. Um, uh, you can, you, yeah, you can be prevented from going to class essentially when uh, by, 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 have, by having this checkpoint uh, closed or, or to, to have like a, an Israeli, a 17 years old uh, Israeli soldier sort of make you stop and uh, take you away. Um, and and you see like this tower you just saw is the same here and uh, there is it uh, those checkpoints that don't look that that don't look like they have such a huge imprint although you can see that also these Palestinian homes here clearly was uh, the victim of this implantation but um, but it goes with an entire sort of uh, architectural apparatus that prevents movements and controlled uh, uh, allows for the Israeli army to control anyone they want to control. But if we look at the at the many Israeli colonies in the West Bank, um, uh, we can look at that. I, I used to have access to this. Um, I don't know if I if I should say that that publicly. I don't know if I was supposed to have access to that, but to uh, a sort of software that the Palestinian Authority had were given. Um, uh, 
the infrastructure by the German state, I believe, uh, um, uh, that that is like a sort of quite powerful uh, equivalent of Google Earth uh, over the West Bank and uh, it, to a lesser extent over the Gaza Strip, uh, which allows for. Um, so I I did I did I I went over in in this sort of like powerful Google Earth. I went over each of those colonies and took a, took a photo, so to speak. So you can see, uh, so you can see uh, each colony. I will show right now. Uh, you will see it from from this this perspective, and and then the perspective on the ground. Um, so this one is called uh, Geva Binyamin. It's uh, essentially on the road between when you go from Ramallah to Bethlehem, you have to you have to pass by it. You will see that I I I never go in any of those colony. Like this is part of my this as much as as a you know as a french citizen and as as a visibly uh, uh white uh, person who uh, probably uh, doesn't seem to bear much danger to uh, israeli settlers uh i could i could probably be able to to go in any of them but uh, this is something that i actually sort of refuse to do um yeah and so that's another one, Halamish, which actually has a particularity. Uh, so this is a little bit west of Ramallah, uh, and this has the particularity of facing uh, the Palestinian town of Nabi Saleh, which is uh, in particular, I mean, one of the most, again, like one of the key historical sites of resistance, uh, where people gather to to demonstrate against uh, the occupation, but also the home of uh, Haid Tamimi and uh, her family. Uh, so this is almost what you see from uh, from uh, their like just like a dozen of meters from their home, as uh, is Israeli settlements. Uh, this is a photo I took uh, uh, just this year in May when I was back with uh, friends and comrades of uh, the Palestine Festival of Literature. We were all of us were on top of this hill looking at this Israeli colony in front of us. This is a sort of entrance uh, of the colony um, with, uh, as you can see, two Israeli soldiers, again, who might be anywhere between 17 to 20 year old with uh, machine guns uh, manning the entrance. And this is the entrance of Nabi Saleh itself with uh, an Israeli uh, observation tower and uh, uh, and roads that are uh, regularly, if not all the permanently uh, shutdowns that force uh, Palestinians to do a pretty big detour to actually reach the village. Uh, this is Hargilo. So Hargilo is in um, is in the south of Jerusalem, uh, of uh, the south of e East Jerusalem, um, and um, on the way to in one of the access to um, to Bejala, which is uh, one of the sort of peripheral neighborhoods of or of of uh, well peripheral neighborhood. It's one of the uh, town that was sort of uh, reached by uh, Bethlehem in in uh, Bethlehem being like grow, having grown significantly in the past in the past thirty years. Uh, this is Haroma, which is also facing Bethlehem, also in the south of East Jerusalem, uh, a massive uh, Israeli colony uh, that went to replace, I don't have a photo because again, the, the rule is I use only my photo, but um, uh, if you ever find a photo of what it used to be like, this little hill uh, uh, south of East Jerusalem, there was just like a forest, a beautiful forest on top of this hill that was completely annihilated by the construction of this colony. Uh, this is the biggest colony in the entire West Bank. Uh, it's called Malia Dumim, uh, and it's home of, if I'm not mistaken, something like 80,000 Israeli settlers. Uh, so that's that's how you see it. Uh, same thing when you're driving from Ramallah to Bethlehem on the West Bank side. If you don't have a a permit to cross the wall. Um, this is Pesagot, which is a smaller colony, but that has a particularity of touching Ramallah. Uh, so again, when you're in Ramallah, this is uh, those are your neighbors, basically your militarized uh, neighbors who, uh, at times like currently, like may just as well just uh, uh, come as a as an armed group in in the Palestinian uh, in Palestinian town and start start shooting at people or putting fire on building. Um, this is a colony called Koshav Yaakov um, that is also very close from Ramallah and actually quite very close from the refugee camp, Palestinian refugee camp of Kalandia. 
So this is a photo taken from the refugee camp here. Uh, and again, you know, for for more detail, I mean, something I should have said perhaps uh, for more details on 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 uh, specifically the architecture of this colony, you can you can go back to your classics and read A. L. Weisman's uh, uh, Civilian Occupation with Rafi Segal, or even better, uh, his book Hollow Land, uh, that of course is uh, both one of the first sort of like really huge work on the matter and, and a canonical book uh, for the questions we're looking at today. Uh, but quite interestingly, you can see this is a photo I took in 2010, and this is in 2017, and you can see that uh, clearly the, um, uh, in particular, the, 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 I think it might have started, uh, it might have started again towards the end of the Obama administration, but clearly with Trump coming uh, coming over, uh, the Israeli colonies construction that might have been frozen for a few years have been have been uh, restart resumed in uh, at full speed as you as you can see on this photo. Uh, Pisgat Zev is completely in East Jerusalem, and uh, you can see it from the West Bank side or from the refugee uh, Shrafat refugee camps that we'll see a little bit more uh, here. Uh, Peace Gadzev is in is a little bit more towards Jericho, so almost in the Jordan Valley. I'm, I've you know this might be a little bit uh, uh, repetitive to to show all those colonies, but I think they they both have common points in architecture and also their specificities depending on the region they're in right now. So uh, that's why I felt it was important to perhaps uh, show them. And Kiryat Arba is the last one I will show. It's very close from the city of Hebron of uh, Al Khalil. Uh, and uh, and you can see that yeah it has like a sort of commercial areas with those uh, militarized tower, and those militarized tower sort of uh, also uh, extend a bit further uh, in Palestinian towns around Al Khalil, uh, like this one. Uh, you can see with those fields that are cultivated by um, settlers themselves. Uh, you can see here uh, an Israeli military uh, jeep. Um, and so, yeah, on the way to, if you go from Bethlehem to Al Khalil, you, you pass by this road, essentially. Um, and this, so that was in 2015, and this tower now looks like that in 2023. This is a, the same one. You can you can count how many cameras you, you can find, it's quite a few. Uh, similarly, on the same road, you you would you would see other towers of the kind that hovers uh, uh, above a Palestinian towns, and that drives me to uh, quite literally to Al Khalil itself, that uh, concentrate on a very very small perimeter all those sort of uh, all all these sort of settler colonial uh, uh, architectural apparatus. Uh, that you can see on a map here at uh, the scale of the entire city. So Al Khalil is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it is the biggest town in uh, in the West Bank. Uh, people may assume it's Ramallah because this is where the Palestinian Authority is based, but uh, it is not. Um, and so it's a pretty huge town, but for a lot of it that is under what uh, the Oslo Accord determined to be uh, H2, which is the equivalent of Area C, at the scale of the West Bank. So Area C, I haven't talked about it, but essentially it's uh, 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 it's the C as in S-E-A -S that I was showing on the metaphorical map earlier. So uh, it's an area, it's 63% of the West Banks that are in uh, still under absolute Israeli, or Israeli military uh, control. Uh, and so at the scale of, Heb of, of Hebron, of Al Khalil, uh, um, a huge part of the city is actually under under this uh, this sort of area that uh, at the scale of Al Khalil is called H two, uh, and then more particularly within the within the old the historical town itself, um, uh, this this area is uh, yeah this entire area of the historical uh, uh, part of the of the city is under full Israeli military control. In particular, the the oldest part of town and the old souk. But also importantly, and I'll show it in a minute. In a minute, the Al Abrimi Mosque, which is um, the mosque where Ibrahim and Sarah, so Abraham, Abraham and Sarah, his wife, are buried. Um, 
so in uh, that's that's what it looks like uh, with this all this being completely an Israeli colony with uh, 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 despite this being like the Islamic uh, cemetery and this is the old Zouk. So all this area is under full Israeli military control. But as you will see, this this sort of area, the, the colony proper, uh, is even with a tighter uh, degree of absolute military control that I'll, I'll show in just a second. Uh, so this is this is what it looks like. So you you can recognize here on the map that I just show. Uh, I mean the, on the photo aerial photo I just show. You can recognize the Islamic um, um, cemetery here, and that's like this sort of axis that we cannot really see, but we can sort of guess is the axis of the Israeli colony within the historical town. And um, adjacent to it is the market, uh, the Palestinian market, but so Israeli settlers are literally living above it. So they are throwing uh, various objects on, um, uh, on Palestinians. So uh, Palestinians had to build this sort of protective net above their above their heads that you you will see uh we, this is also something we can see in uh, in um in uh, Jerusalem's old, old city uh so you can see here there's a, a watchtower above our heads when we are in the market uh, in Hebron um this is a photo from this year I have to say you know <laughs> I'm this is a little bit uh, uh seeing the the glass with one drop of water more. <laughs> So it's really not much, but I, I felt in 2023, the, the, the life of the market was a little bit more intense than in the past years that I had visited the city. So, you know, we might take what we what we can in terms of optimism, but I think Palestinians have been fighting hard to reopen some store to make sure that life continues uh, even despite under duress and then to renovate uh, some old buildings that were that would have been otherwise starting to fall off. Uh, and yeah, there's like dozens and dozens of Palestinian uh, stores that had been closed uh, during the Second Intifada and that were never, never opened back, as you can see. Uh, so this is even, yeah, so, so, those stores are even, uh, are even like beyond uh, various, uh, various checkpoints. So they're even more empty. Uh, this is a Palestinian school over here. So you can imagine being at school with this degree of uh, of militarization surrounding you. Uh, this is one of the checkpoints towards uh, the Israeli colony itself in the in the old town. This is actually not the most impressive one, but that shows you a little bit the sort of things that uh, um, uh, compose the, the landscape of uh, Palestinians living in Al Khalil. Um, this is a um, uh, this is another checkpoint, and uh, you can see that I, I am beyond it myself, as uh, this is something that as part of, of PALFEST, so the Palestinian Festival of Literature, we've been doing where uh, international guests are invited to sort of feel the discomfort, I mean, are invited to be able to see for themselves the colony itself, but also feel the discomfort of leaving our Palestinian friends here uh, on that side of the town because they would not get admitted within. Um, Going back a little bit more towards the market, this is one uh, one other checkpoint to the to the Israeli colony within it, and this is probably the most impressive one. This is a photo from twenty fifteen, and now it has evolved into an even bigger monster uh, that looks like that, and so that's that's the same photo 2015, 2023, exact same photo. Um, I, I actually remembered my photo from 2015, so I tried to retake it with the exact same angle. And so that's what it looks like a little bit closer, uh, uh, including with so with uh, those uh, turnstile and uh, that leads to like this uh, uh, control of IDs that again, no Palestinian uh, who would not have like a very special residency permit uh, uh, would not be able to access. And then you can even see uh, the AI controlled machine gun on top of, of the checkpoint uh, with this uh, horribly cynical uh, name called Smart Shooter. Uh, so you can see the, the sort of like the most intense form of checkpoints uh, in the West Bank here, quite quite simply. And, and 
beyond these checkpoints, this is what the Israeli colony looks like. Uh, uh, there are some Israeli buildings that they built, but this is the, what's left of the Palestinian town that is, of course, completely desert. And then taken over with Zionist propaganda. And then to, as I said, you have the Ali Baremi uh, mosque uh, within uh, within that colony that has like a special access itself, as you can see, but with like a bunker, an Israeli bunker just above it. Uh, but in that case, that can have um, a Palestinian of Al Khalil actually um, enter the mosque when when you know, but based on the on the quote unquote goodwill of the occupying army. And actually, when we were there this year with Palfest, uh, we even had the visit of uh, an entire contingent of Israeli uh, uh, military service soldiers uh, penetrating in the mosque itself uh, with their shoes on. Uh, and, and in that case, those are, those are the 17 years old uh, uh, recruits, so to speak, but uh, with, of course, their commanders uh, with machine guns uh, on it. So a quite, a quite shocking scene, uh, right, right, right in front of, uh, of um, the grave of, um, of uh, Abraham and Sarah, which actually are also, uh, for part of it, are also in a sort of uh, uh, settler synagogue uh, that they built, Abraham being, of course, uh, the founder, the, not the founder, but the the common ancestor to the three uh, Abrahamic uh, uh, religions that are uh, Islam, Judaism, and uh, and Christianity. If we now go to Al Quds, so Jerusalem, um, I'll and I'll, um, I'll, you know, the scale, the scale of Al Khalil is very, very small, as you can see. In that case, it's at the scale of an entire city, which is Jerusalem. And uh, it's a little bit more, but you can still see Jerusalem as being like one one site where uh, a lot of, um, yeah, like uh, where um, where all this sort of occupy, occupy, architecture of occupation is very much at work. So Jerusalem as a, as a, as a reminder, uh, so the, the west of Jerusalem was invaded by Zionist paramilitary group in 1948. Um, and, uh, and then the east of Jerusalem, uh, so that's sorry. The, uh, I should say the north is on the right side here, and I'll, I'll in just a second I'll bring back the north on the top side. That may be easier. Uh, but here again, using the sort of horizontal uh, screen, uh, I find it useful. So the west part of Jerusalem is this part here, and the east part of Jerusalem is this part here. Um, and so the eastern uh, part of the of uh, of the of the city on the other side of the so-called 1949 uh, Green Line um was invaded in uh, in June 1967 that includes the old city itself so the entire old city is within uh, east jerusalem um and and then the city was immediately um occupied as an annex to the to the israeli state but then the official the official year in which uh, israel uh, officially annexed uh, East Jerusalem, the same way they've been talking about annexing the entire West Bank and no longer occupying it, but just claiming it as fully their own, not just as a, a sort of militarily uh, and settler occupied uh, territory. Uh, so for East Jerusalem, it was 1981. Uh, so that means that means an even higher degree, complexity of hierarchy in um in the sort of colonial uh, administrative status between Palestinians. So if I maybe take a, a small moment to describe that, at the scale of Palestine, so not even talking about refugees in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and then the diaspora and all that, at the scale of Palestine, you have Palestinians with a different status that are Palestinians were refugees in Gaza, Palestinians were refugees in the West Bank, uh, Palestinian in Gaza, Palestinian in the West Bank, Palestinian in the West Bank with a permit to actually cross the apartheid wall, which is only 10% of them, Palestinian without a permit, uh, then Palestinians will live in East Jerusalem, uh, then Palestinians will live in 48 Palestine, who are um, uh, technically uh, uh, citizens of, of the Israeli state, but with a, a very special status. Uh, 
And then uh, Palestinians in, in East Jerusalem, of course, uh, have a much higher degree of um, uh, movement of, of the possibility to move in historical Palestine than uh, Palestinians in the West Bank and, of course, even more than Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, but then uh, the, the, this very particular status of being Palestinian resident of East Jerusalem is the one that is also the most precarious in terms of whether you're able to keep it or not. If you if you move to, even for some of them, I mean, I, I know it's a little bit more complicated than that, but even for some of them to just go study abroad or something like that, you might lose your status. Um, and so, and so it's been it's been part of the, the sort of the the colonial administration strategy to also um, uh, to 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 also make sure that every time they were able to like strip a Palestinian uh, Jerusalemite uh, uh, from their status from their residency, they they would be able to do so. In which case, they would find themselves with. Uh, no other choice to perhaps move to the West Bank or even not being able to really uh, stay in Palestine. So again, the, the Nakba, the, the ethnic cleansing is permanent. It's not just 1948, it is a permanent process. Um, so if you if you do allow me for to, again, do a 90 degrees uh, uh, rotation of that map and then even increase to uh, such a way that we're able to see Ramallah here. So Ramallah is here, Bethlehem is here. Abu Dis is uh, sort of uh, used to be a village that uh, uh, grew uh, exponentially uh, in the past three decades uh, and then formed and then joined the sort of uh, built environment of the uh, of East Jerusalem, but uh, with uh, the, the apartheid wall cutting it uh, now. But so, of course, this is a very small map, so I'll I'll go point by point, and I'll go back. Every time I show you something else, I'll go back to that map, and I'll show you where it is. So we're going to start with Bethlehem. And here in this very part, so at the very edge of the map here, um, uh, with this Israeli colony here called Gilo, this uh, bridge over here called the Gilo Viaduct. And uh, you'll see the, the next few photos I took will be from, from this area here. So this is a viaduct. So this is a bridge that essentially is an Israeli uh, road, in which uh, West Bank cars have no possible no possibility to to be on, despite being completely in the West Bank and and literally above the West Bank. I think, you know, again going back to El Weisman's uh, work, uh, this is what he calls the politics of verticality. The, the fact that the occupation is also, you know, when you show it on a map, it's difficult to show the verticality, but somehow we also need to do sections of uh, the architecture of settler colonialism, because then we're able to appreciate how uh, everything is layered as well. And then on the foreground, you you can see also the uh, the apartheid walls that in this in this very specific part, uh, uh, which on the on the left part you have the valley of Kremisa, uh, is actually not made of concrete but out of um, out of um, uh, barbed wire and and uh, and metal. Uh, and this is where the so this road here uh, goes right after into a tunnel here uh, to go under Bejala. Um and um, and so this is where the wall uh, creates this weird uh, sort of color um, over here to prevent uh, Palestinians from accessing this place that uh, Israel consider as its own territory. And this is what the wall looks like looking at the valley behind. Uh, if we now move a little bit east uh, over here, which is a Palestinian refugee camp of Aida within Bethlehem, and then uh, and then I have a few more photos here of that wall over here. Um, that actually, uh, this this map is from 2015, but things have even uh, uh, become even more complex uh, over here. But this refugee camp essentially looks like that. I'll go back to the architecture of refugee camps at the very end. But basically, uh, the the apartheid wall is uh, is right there, and then uh, and then in the back of the refugee camp or in the front, I don't know. Uh, this is this is what it looks like. And then within within the north of Bethlehem, leading to I mean, what separates Bethlehem from uh, from Jerusalem? Uh, you have you have the apartheid wall itself that ultimately lead to. Uh, 
the 300 checkpoint here, which is the main checkpoint uh, between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. So it's crossed by um, hundreds of <coughs> Palestinian workers with permits um, every morning who have to line up in this corridor um, and uh, and lead to, again, like a, an architecture of of control of bodies, uh, in particular the corridor, like I've, I mean, I've, I'm not gonna bore you with that right now, but I've, uh, I find the the, the architectural typology of the corridor as being the sort of archetypical, um, the archetypical form of control of bodies, uh, 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 with this sort of parallel to walls. Uh, um, if we go a little bit further and we go back to the colony of Haroma here that I already showed you, the, the one that I said, like, uh, I used to have like a forest, a beautiful forest on top of the hill, and that is now being replaced by this atrocity. Uh, this is what it looks like also from, from Bethlehem with, uh, again, the apartheid wall here being a little bit more transparent than it usually is, but with like, uh, uh, uh like don't, don't, don't think of it as it for its mayor physicality in that case, but there's also like a, an entire uh, technological system of uh, all this, all this is like sensors and, uh, and, uh, and all this that prevents any sort of movement from Palestinians to, to cross it. Uh, and then if we move to, sorry, I need to <laughs> make sure what the next slide is. Yeah, right. If we, if we move over here, uh, which is Al-Quds University campus, so one of the main university as well, uh, Palestinian University, that was very conveniently during the construction of the apartheid wall. During the Second Intifada, uh, the wall started to be built in 2003. You can see that the wall has been built to make sure that the campus, which again, as a university, is one of the key sites of our Palestinian resistance, uh, I believe that the, the photos that circulated a lot recently of it was Saeed throwing stones at uh, 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 throw, throw, throwing stones uh, uh, was on that campus, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, someone might correct me, but I, I believe it was. Uh, and so this is what the campus looks like. So you see Faculty of Educational Sciences, and then in the background you have this apartheid wall that uh, prevents any access to, to Jerusalem. Um, when you go out from the campus, this is literally your view, the view you have. And then if we go a little bit further uh, to this area here, um, you will see that, so this is a view of Jerusalem, you recognize uh, as a Dome of the Rock here uh, on Alexa Mosque. Um, uh, so the, the old city is clearly here. There's a, a holy sepulcher, like where Jesus is uh, buried over here. So all the old city is here and you can see it, but you can also see that on the foreground, um, uh, on the foreground, uh, the apartheid wall. And I just so happened to have taken this picture on the roof of, of what was going to be the, the building of the Palestinian Legislative Council, in, in other words, the Palestinian parliament. Uh, that the Oslo Accords uh, had had uh, designed uh, to to have, and then uh, in two thousand three, during the the Second Intifada, during the construction of the of the building, the the construction was was halted by the uh, occupation army as being um, uh, as being a, a dead project essentially. Uh, and so, very very closely from there is uh, when you're in Abu Dis, you can have. Basically, uh, so something someone like me who has a European passport is able to go on that side of the wall, which is the side of the West Bank. Um, I mean, the side of the West Bank. Yeah, uh, that separates the West Bank and East Jerusalem. But don't don't think that the wall is the trace of uh, you know what the UN calls the Green Line. Like the wall is not on the Green Line, as you as you can obviously see. Uh, the wall. Uh, throughout the West Bank is trying to bring as much territory as possible on its western part towards uh, Israel, despite those areas being, for some of it, uh, like like here, a Palestinian uh, neighborhoods. So here you can see uh, a photo on the on the east part of the wall, and then this is the same on the west part of the wall. You can recognize the minaret here. And then to show you how much things have been changing, which is not much in that case, this is a photo from 2010. 
And this is the same photo that I took just this year, 20, 2023, with uh, the addition of this massive, again, like this sort of like almost comical, like you would see that almost as a, a sort of grotesque uh, a piece of art in a museum uh, uh, with, I don't know, again, how many cameras and then, a, 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 yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, you can see how the wall is uh, also following a, a yeah, a very, a very particular path. Uh, and this is actually the oldest photo of the, of the whole set. This is my first visit in Palestine in 28. Um, and I, I really like this photo also because you can see the, the beautiful hills of Jordan in the back. So that was a day where you could have full visibility. Like those, those hills are actually, I don't know, like, uh, 30 kilometers east of, uh, Jerusalem, perhaps even more. Uh, and now if we move to the old city itself, and uh, if I remember my slides correctly, uh, this area here, yeah, uh, the area, like a very vibrant area of East Jerusalem, which is um, along, oh no, sorry, uh, sorry, I remember my slide. Before that, uh, uh, here is this neighborhood of Silwan, which is, uh, uh, which looks like that, and is also, you know, you might remember 2021, Shergera, uh, the neighborhood that it was, that is being ethnically, ethnically cleansed, and I'll, I'll show a few photos in just a moment, in the north of East Jerusalem, here on the south of the old city, still one has been a little bit less discussed in our solidarity efforts, but is is also a place that is threatened uh, on a daily basis by the takeover of more and more Israeli settlers who have, have had their eyes on it for quite a while, and they're actually uh, building a cable car uh, between the, the two sides of this of this hill. Uh, and of course, in the old city itself, you have Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, uh, you can see here that uh, the windows, again, like uh, if we if we go to the entire scale of architecture and not talk just about sort of geopolitical dimension and, uh, and the wall at the scale of dozens of kilometers and everything, but actually if we if we talk also to uh, the smaller element, uh, the the windows, the, the door, the key, which I'm I'm always very drawn to. Uh, those windows were uh, destroyed uh, by the Israeli army just two years ago, uh, throwing tear gas inside the inside the mosque uh, uh, while worshippers were were still in it, um, as you might have as you might remember. And so those those windows have not been replaced yet. Um, and this is a typical view of uh, the old city in which you have a Palestinian kindergarten here uh, that is that has to be surrounded by uh, a rusty uh, barbed wire to because of uh, some settlers incursion from other roof. And then uh, right outside the old city, um, this is a photo I took during the um, uh, during what you might remember as being the metal detector intifada. Uh, when uh, the Israeli um, occupation army wanted to place metal detectors at the entrance of uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, so the entire the Al Aram, like the entire esplanade of, uh, which is the third uh, holiest site of Islam uh, in the world, um, uh, and so and so Palestinians had revolted, and then consequently uh, the Israeli army had uh, set up some uh, temporary checkpoints, such as this one, for only um, settlers and tourists to be able to enter uh, the old city. This is Damascus Gate. So you can see it in the back here. So Damascus Gate is like the one of the main one of the key entrance of the old city in the. Um, uh, to the uh, uh, one of the main entrance to the old city, yeah, in in East Jerusalem. Uh, well, all of them are in East Jerusalem, of course, but uh, I think that's the one that usually uh, Palestinians are are known to to use. And then you can see this is in 2017. So basically, we went from this sort of very clearly temporary uh, apparatus, although you can add to it like those those things, the cameras and everything, to this architecture here uh, that is quite new. Of uh, of a military checkpoint at the entrance of a of you know a historical site, uh, you know usually the Zionist narrative like sort of very much promotes the weight of history and and uh, 
and uh, and um, and uh, the sanctity of Jerusalem and all that. But clearly, they have no problem whatsoever building a super ugly uh, checkpoint at the entrance of one of the one of the gate. Um, I believe now we're moving to Mount of Olives and Mount Scopus. So here and here. Uh, and yeah, looking at the back toward the east. Uh, so being here and looking looking to the east, we can see that road over here that is split by the apartheid wall itself, as you can see. Like the road itself is split between uh, uh, two with a checkpoint over here. And then a little bit more on the right side, uh, this Israeli highway that um, uh, goes towards uh, the Dead Sea and that goes under the Mount of Olive uh, to, to reach uh, the rest of uh, West Jerusalem. Um, yeah, so now talking about Sher Jarrah itself that you might remember in 2021, massive, massive Palestinian revolt to uh, prevent uh, I guess to prevent the ethnic cleansing of it to be um, to be done in silence. Uh, so Sher Jarrah is this neighborhood over here, and um, and so more and more uh, each house is being taken over by Israeli settlers. Uh, so this one is one of the most one of the most recent one in twenty twenty one, and it's facing the house of uh, two activists you are probably quite familiar with, uh, Mohammed and Munah El Kurd whose house itself is being uh, occupied for part of it by uh, three Israeli settlers. Uh, uh, or actually, they might not even be Israelis, actually. Uh, uh, American Zionist, or I forgot. I, forgot. I mean, Mohammed would... would, uh, would there's probably some... Uh, Mohammed probably talked about it somewhere. Um, and then going to, again, continuing our, our sort of panning north, here you have the Palestinian refugee camp of Shuafat uh, that is, as you can see, almost completely surrounded by the apartheid wall itself. And all of it is actually under, falls under the Jerusalem municipality line. So technically, this is a neighborhood of, um, uh, of which the Jerusalem municipality, of course, it is a settler colonial municipality. It's an Israeli municipality, but technically it is uh, part of, of the purview of uh, the Israeli municipality. Uh, which is, you know, supposed to provide like a, a minimum of public services, uh, uh, but it's it actually was placed on the other side of the of the apartheid wall, and so this is what it looks like. Uh, the fact that the buildings are so high is definitely not innocent in the fact that there is no uh, sort of governing entity on that particular neighborhood, and so there is no building code either. So. Uh, those buildings are all extremely uh, built in in a very sort of precarious way and uh, and fragile way, and um, and you can see the wall surrounding the entire the entire neighborhood, and this is a checkpoint to actually access the neighborhood. I mean, if you access it in that direction, it's actually going from uh, East Jerusalem to uh, the refugee camp, so uh, pretty much anyone can go because it's, that's never that direction. That's a problem. It's going back. And uh, and you can see when you're on top of the of the refugee camp, you can see the Israeli colony uh, right across uh, from it, and you can see quite far actually. Uh, like Ramallah is basically be behind those uh, behind those hill. Again, the wall that surrounds the all those photos except for the first one are inside the camp itself. So we were here, the Shuafat camp, uh, the colony I show you was this colony. And when I said like looking looking north, uh, that was looking in that direction. And so going closer and closer to uh, the most northern part of Eastern, you know, of East Jerusalem, uh, you have an entire area, area here that is cut by the wall, despite being again, Palestinian on, on, on both sides. Um, And so this is what it looks like when you when you go north. Um, eventually, to reach Kalandia checkpoint, which is the biggest checkpoint of the West Bank that links Jerusalem with Ramallah, a little bit more in the north, with again an entire part of the of the city being uh, behind the apartheid wall. 
now this is a checkpoint looking from the eastern side of the so that's where uh, as a palestinian worker with a permit you would you would go to actually cross the wall uh, uh to to work um to work west of the wall um and and essentially this consists in this very convoluted and very controlled uh, uh uh, apparatus, including those turnstiles that uh, Israeli soldiers have a, a cruel, a cruel joy in uh, locking every time someone is in it. So you you find yourself quite literally locked. You cannot go back, but you cannot uh, move forward either. If you are anywhere close to claustrophobic, that's a horrible experience. Uh, so yeah, so basically all this pedestrian uh, checkpoint is uh, under those roof, and then the apartheid wall is right behind it. And that is more the the car side of things. And uh, recently, they set up this uh, pedestrian bridge actually to eventually reach what used to be over here uh, as a former airport of uh, Jerusalem, uh, Palestinian airport. It was uh, even a, an air company called Air Palestine. Uh, and so the the airport very recently has been reasphalted uh, um, and transformed into a parking lot. So that was it for the West Bank and, uh, and Jerusalem. Uh, and now if we move to the third uh, space, which is 48 Palestine uh, or Israel, uh, we can look at a few different places, in particular Lifta in uh, West Jerusalem. So uh, it's over here. So Lifta used to be a Palestinian village um, that uh, months prior to the establishment of the state of Israel was raided by a um, Zionist paramilitary group who uh, massacred a part of the population and evicted the rest of it. But uh, in Lifta is one of those rare places that are still visible within, uh, uh, despite being surrounded by an Israeli city, namely West Jerusalem. Uh, and so, and so the, there is a power of story of, of narrative in that in those runes, uh, despite being tagged, as you can see, with uh, Israeli, uh, by Israeli taggers, um, uh, that uh, is still quite, quite strong in the story it's able to tell the, you know, the, uh, the total, the, the, the architectural proof that the whole Zionist narrative of a, a land without a, a, a people without a land, a land without a people for a people without a land being a, a, a total fallacy. Um, and you can see that those, those runes, those Palestinian runes are still living with like more and more over the years, more and more uh, Israeli, uh, 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 architectural neighbors, so to speak, uh, and then within bigger within other uh, big cities such as Haifa, which has uh, I believe a twenty five percent Palestinian uh, population, um, you can you you also have those sort of living proof of uh, the lie uh, on which uh, Zionism is built of uh, Palestinians not really existing or or. Um, uh, not really having like any sort of like um, form of uh, of towns or I don't I don't know I don't, I don't know what now yeah but so so you can see that those buildings those Palestinians buildings are still very much uh, very much uh, existing but more and more uh, they're being they're being quite literally built on by Israeli developer projects so I think this is also where like architects like I mean you know this sort of this sort of rendering will look all too familiar to many, many of us over here. Um, and so, so yeah, I think this is something that uh, we ought to, to very much consider. Uh, and then Jaffa, uh, what used to be one of the biggest Palestinian city in uh, pre-48 Palestine, is even perhaps even more painful to visit when you do with, uh, with like um, a sort of, uh, liberal Israeli uh, uh, middle class moving more and more from Tel Aviv to to Jaffa to Jaffa uh, um, uh, through in those uh, in those uh, kind of buildings that uh, remind us of many architecture of gentrification around around the world but that in that case is a is an even more intensively colonial uh, gentrification that you can think of 
uh, where the word Jaffa itself is being even uh, denied. Like uh, we are, we are way south of. Uh, I mean, we are way inside uh, uh, Jaffa in that case. And this former Palestinian building has like the name Tel Aviv on it. Um, and then in the, the area that separates uh, Tel Aviv from Jaffa, uh, you had a Palestinian uh, neighborhood called Al Manshir. Uh, that was uh, absolutely obliterated by the, the Zionist paramilitary groups uh, that uh, invaded Jaffa in 1948. And um, this horrible museum uh, that they built uh, on top of a Palestinian um, former uh, mercant uh, building, uh, right next to the beach was like, you know, uh, the, the, again, the sort of like, the tourists that uh, the Zionist uh, uh, propaganda manages to to bring to to the beach in uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, saying that this is a, a paradise for all liberals and queers and feminists of uh, of the world. Um, then, right next to it, you have this horrible museum dedicated to the to the to the history of this uh, Zionist paramilitary group uh, uh, that uh, massacred people and took over Jaffa in 1948. It's called the Igorn. And uh, yeah, I think this this museum is uh, also is a testimony to, I think, to something we sort of don't discuss that much because it sounds like too subjective and not very serious to say that, but also how ugly the colony is and uh i was i was just recently uh in the southwest of the us uh right alongside like along the uh, border towns of um, of the navarro nation and that that was that what really hit me up uh, how ugly the the colony also is uh architecturally speaking uh, in particular and um yeah so this museum is probably a testament to that and then al lead is what uh what people would call the mixed city in uh, 48 Palestine, meaning that it's a city where uh, Palestinians uh, um, Palestinians live uh, quite literally alongside uh, Israelis. Uh, and then in um, in the city you can you can find some still some mark of uh, of the of the uh, Palestinian town it used to be pre pre 48 uh, with various runes uh, for those that were not destroyed. Uh, in particular, this market in the center of the town, and uh, uh, you know, I we went twice with Palfest uh, in 2019 and 2003, exactly at this place. And when we came back in 2023, it just absolutely hit me, uh, uh, being exactly where I am right now, taking this photo in 2019, that it was that uh, ju in just the very few years that separated those two photos, they had managed to build like a totally useless uh, uh, European-looking uh, uh, streets and then walled off uh, the market itself um, in a pretty outrageous way, as you can see. Like, I mean, if you if you want to see those four years of difference just between those two photos. So, yeah. And, and in Alid is also, it's also the site. I mean, I think quite, quite importantly, you know, the, the photos I've been showing you in the past uh, three minutes or five minutes, um our photos of Palestinian buildings that we can still see there we can still the, we can still see the ruins the ruins are able to tell the story of both how they used to exist and how they were destroyed in 1948 but more often than not Palestinian villages and Palestinian entire parts of Palestinian towns have been not just destroyed the ruins themselves were destroyed and this is the case here on this site like very ugly site with like a, a uh, um, uh, a garbage container and uh, and all that. This used to be the site of the of the house of uh, Georgia Bash, uh, who is the founder of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and on which there's literally no nothing nothing left. And then one of the variation. This is no longer in lead. One of the variation that uh, the Israeli state has been has been. Uh, has been doing to hide also the, the Palestinian villages and the few ruins that are left is to declare them as natural reserve, as na national natural reserve. Uh, and then uh, in the case of the Jewish National Fund that you can see here, the JNF, uh, that used to collect uh, pre-48, used to distribute like little money boxes uh, 
in the Jewish diaspora along, uh, around the world uh, in, in the diaspora that had some uh, Zionist uh, sort of sympathy, but again, pre-48, which is, I think, also something to be judged a little bit differently, although, uh, although it was inscribed in the very uh, nature of Zionism, what, what, uh, what it was going to be, the sort of settler colonial and ethnic cleansing uh, dimension of it. But so the GNF went from um, having like uh, collecting a bit of money to to buy land from Palestinians in uh, historical Palestine, something that pre forty eight uh, uh, Palestinian uh, activist maybe it's maybe pre forty eight perhaps that's not the right word for it, but uh, Palestinian activists were uh, very adamant in in uh, Palestinian uh, people not selling their land, uh, precisely fearing what would what would then happen. Um, and uh, and so the GNF went from having this money for to buy land to no longer needing to buy land since uh, the land had been invaded and had become Israel. So it completely uh, started a new activity, which is to um, to grow uh, forest. So that's why you can see a little tree here. And part of the part of what the GNF has been doing is to grow pine forest in particular in a in a sort of effort of. Europeanization of Palestine, like a way to for uh, Ashkenazi uh, Israelis, who of course are the sort of like the uh, you know there's something to be said of it. That's I'm not a specialist of the Israeli society itself, but uh, there's something to be said about the Ashkenazi supremacy uh, within uh, the Israeli society itself. And so these Eastern European uh, uh, deciders, like wanting to wanting to Europeanize. The Levant by growing uh, pine trees is not innocent, and even less is innocent is the fact of growing trees quite often on former Palestinian villages in a way that would disseminate uh, their past presence to everyone. And so, finishing with uh, perhaps something a little bit more um, that has more to do with Palestinian resistance, which is kind of the opposite of this photo right here, which is a photo uh, that I took six years ago of the construction site of Rawabi, which is this uh, completely built out of nothing, uh, 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 new Palestinian town north of Pier Zayt, um, well, west of Pier Zayt, really, um, that a uh, Palestinian millionaire uh, has, or billionaire perhaps, uh, has been uh, has been pushing to build as a sort of, as a sort of hyperbole of, um, of an era uh, that followed the Second Intifada in which the Palestinian Authority, uh, I don't know, that's perhaps that's there's something a little bit more subtle to be said, but essentially lost interest in the struggle for liberation and started to want to, to develop uh, the little part of territory on that under its very relative sovereignty to develop it economically. And so that's, that, uh, that created like the, the north side of Ramallah that you can see today with like many, many developments, many architectural developments, some of which looks exactly like Israeli colonies in terms of their architecture to, uh, to this town of Rawabi that is just like the, the, the apex of an, a Palestinian architecture made for the Palestinian bourgeoisie in which the occupation becomes becomes uh, invisible. And so Palestinian refugee camp, in my view, are the exact opposite of this architecture. Uh, this one is the one of Kalandia. Uh, and it's, it is, um, it is uh, an architecture that might appear at first glance at, as a messy, but I think uh, a more, uh, a much better way to say it's more than messy is uncontrollable by an, an outside force, be it the Palestinian Authority, which has no authority over a Palestinian refugee camp anyway, uh, but also of the Israeli military that uh, uh, find, has quite a bit of trouble uh, fighting the uh, Palestinian fighters, in particular, as you've seen last year in uh, in uh, Naples and uh, Jenin. Um, and, for, and this one is in Ida in Bethlehem, the one we already saw. And I think this is what I was hinting at at the very beginning in my introduction in saying that um, sometimes, art, you know, architecture, in my, in my opinion, architecture can never be liberatory. It can never be emancip emancipatory, but it can sometimes provide the spatial condition of the revolutionary struggle, like, like, and, and 
my favorite example in, in that sense is uh, Algiers Casbah, so the oldest part of Algier, that in 1957, when the French colonial army was trying to dismantle the Algerian revolution uh, in, in Algier, in the capital city, uh, uh, find a lot of trouble fighting the, the Algerian National Liberation Front in a part of town that was very, again, like very dense, uh, very sinuous, what what the colonizers would call labyrinthine, even though like anyone who lives there, of course, would not find it labyrinthine, no one would get lost, and and uh, allows also for the inhabitants and the non the inhabitants who are not taking necessarily a part in the in the sort of the most literal or direct form of resistance to actually very much participate in the solidarity with uh, with the fighters in opening their homes in allowing for people to move from one roof to another and to have uh, and uh, those different uh, things uh, that in the case of Algeria and in the case of Palestine is, uh, I find, quite um, inspiring for the way we think about architecture. And this is the last slide I will have. Uh, happy to also have some friends from uh, who were invited at the Palfest edition of uh, 2019. In the middle, you have Nikestas, uh, a Lakota historian. You can see Samia Heni a little bit behind, uh, Simon Brown, uh, uh, Keller Isterling, uh, Maddie Sabag, Mabel Wilson was right behind Maddie. Uh, and this is the entrance of the Ida refugee camp with uh, this massive key. Uh, and usually I said I'm fascinated by keys, but usually it's because they very much crystallize uh, they, they very much crystallize the political order of architecture uh, uh, in, in, in turning a door into a wall, to put it quite simply. But in the symbology, in the symbology, I don't know if that's a word, of Palestinians, a key is a key of return. It's a key that Palestinian refugees, just like many refugees around the world, uh, have kept from their homes they had to they were evicted from and they had to uh, uh, they had to uh, they were for, forcefully displaced from they kept their key of course not as a way to reopen their house that has been destroyed and again they're perhaps even the ruins of their homes has been have been destroyed but as a very powerful symbol of the return and this is um, uh, this is also where I want to to live it in in how uh, what will be the architecture of return of those five million refugees uh, who uh, uh, will need to come back in a in a in a liberated Palestine? Um, and so the key being this very architectural object, I find it also quite uh, striking to end it on that. And uh, that's it for the hundred seventy one <laughs> slides. Thank you so much for staying for most of you. And uh, I think we might have a, a few questions. We'll, we, we have 25 minutes perhaps to to take them. I don't know if uh, Farah wants to help me with that. Um, well, you could see the Q, uh, like the Q and A. We've got some interesting questions. Um, uh, if you want to choose from them, would you like to do that? Like, for example, we've got a question from Erica. Is the Philadelphia corridor a walled transportation corridor requiring checkpoint access from side to side? Uh, there's only one checkpoint on the Philadelphia corridor. It's the one that um, it's the one that is uh, uh, used when when again, when the CC administration uh, allows for a crossing between Gaza and Egypt. Um, and again, I mean, also bear in mind that when you when you reach Egypt, you're basically at the end of the of the Sinai. Uh, and then to reach uh, the closest, uh, um, uh, I mean, to reach Cairo, for example, uh, would take like a, a very long drive. But uh, but again, this this checkpoint is as the nature of checkpoint can be closed anytime and has been closed many, 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 many times. Uh, and something I forgot to say is in 2015, also uh, CC uh, 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 accepted to, um, uh, I mean, made a deal with the Israeli state to destroy uh, the, the entire part of the Egyptian side of Rafah 
uh, so that uh, so that uh, the tunnels that uh, allows for uh, the few goods uh, that allows for breaking a little bit the the uh, the blockade the very murderous blockade because again you know we're we're talking about a ceasefire right now but the when the ceasefire comes is that uh, we will many many I mean hundreds of people will keep dying because they will have no access to health or no access to food. Uh, because precisely of the blockade itself, and so the, those tunnels uh, that leads to Egypt are the only the only channels that allows for um, for for goods to to be brought in. Uh, so yeah, so I guess that's that's it. I'm seeing uh, so some of the, I've been answered by other. Um, so how are you able to take this many pictures of military zones? I heard the Israeli army may control your camera and your phone when leaving Israel. How do you manage this? How does the idea of not say anything when you're taking pictures of the towers? Thank you for the webinar. Okay. Hi, Yusuf. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I suppose most of the picture you've seen today, you've seen them relatively well, uh, composed and so that probably means that I'm I'm in a state of relative comfort that allows me to to take those pictures. Uh, some pictures that I have are taken a little bit more uh, hastingly, so to speak, but it really depends on on the situation. I think in general, um, uh, settler colonialism being on the one hand so total, like just like occupying so much space that it literally cannot control every inch of that space, but also quite quite importantly as well, uh, um, I th I think it's been it's been a while now that the Israeli state is not really scared anymore of anyone from the outside to document the occupation because clearly everyone is aware of it and is not doesn't really change much about how the U.S. state in its very colonial complicity with the state of Israel uh, would, would act or anything like that. So as much as I think what we're doing tonight is, or today or this morning, uh, is uh, is useful, I also think that it, it doesn't really fundamentally uh, change things to show what's happening. So I don't think they're extremely scared. I mean, I yeah, the, the whole uh, phone... Uh, phone camera uh, checking has been there's been some bad experiences for sure but i tend to send everything uh, online before anyway and uh, and sometimes to leave from uh, from uh, to leave from um, amman airport rather than uh, tel aviv's airport which allows for a lesser like um yeah i mean essentially when you enter from jordan the entry is very hard but the exit is pretty easy and then when you go through tel aviv airport the entry is quite hard and then the exit can be a, a nightmare but uh but um yeah but also i mean you know elephant in the room i think being a white guy also allows for a lot of this impunity as well myself although it's not always been the case and it's not always been that that a clear cut but yeah clearly that's also something to consider when answering this question are the, the photos being shown okay to share with credit outside this webinar? Yes, uh, I think most of what I do is usually under Creative Commons uh, licensing, so you can you can all go. Uh, what is the permitting process to build the structural support of the Israeli Gilo viaduct in Palestine? Uh, they, I mean, they the Israeli state can do whatever whatever it wants. It it occupies the territory, so I don't think it. I don't think it creates much of a problem. Um, ah, okay, I think Edward said it's rolls a rock in one of the visits to the border in south of Lebanon. So perhaps that's me who, um, uh, I think I know why I, I made this association because I remember in 2021, students of Al-Quds University throwing stones and somehow I think it, it the, the background seemed very similar to me. So I think I mixed up both photos. So Edward said it was in the, in the south of Lebanon, not in Palestine proper. Um, many questions. <laughs> uh, and sorry, as as my, like I, I think I'm skipping some as well because every time someone types a new one, 
uh, yeah. uh, it's sort of skips as well. So, I mean, quite a few people are asking. Uh, uh, quite a few people are asking um, about perhaps uh, some other works and mine to to reference. And of course, you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, my my elders uh, have been. Um, have been uh, A. L. Weisman's work and uh, and um, Sandy Hilal and Alison Ropati in decolonizing architecture, uh, but I think I'm someone who learns as much from his elders as from his uh, uh, younger relatives and uh, and there's been a, a lot of work in particular from Palestinian uh, architects uh, that is uh, important to to mention. I mean uh, I talked about uh, um, Mary Sabag earlier. Uh, Nora Kawi, uh, Dimas Ruji, um, and uh, and many others that uh, now escape my panicking brain after one hour forty minutes of presentation, but um, but I and 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 you know also I think the people I quoted are also people who who live this this uh, the, uh, who, despite. Um, spending a lot of time in Palestine and having grown up in Palestine until pretty recently, are we live in the diaspora? But then many people in Berzeik University uh, have, are also uh, very importantly to be cited. And uh, um, but I, I have to I have to admit this is also why I wanted to to do uh, uh, this presentation strictly based on my own documents because I think. Uh, when it comes to the politics of citation of other people's work, I feel that I'm also a little bit missing from indeed like some some uh, people within Palestine, within the West Bank in particular, uh, who've been doing uh, very important work and um, and uh, as someone who lives outside has been perhaps more familiarized with work, in particular of Israeli uh, architects. I mean, uh, Sharon Rothbard would be another one of it, uh, his book, uh, uh, white city, black city, um, and and of course uh, Israeli architects. I don't think they would they would uh, mind me saying that, but who have the the massive privilege of having access to the to the archive of the of the Zionist state itself, and uh, and uh, and and sort of a, a way to do research that is uh, that is widely different from someone who's a, a researcher, a professor, or a student at Berzeik University or at Al Quds University. Um, There's also an interesting question here. It's about someone wrote, I noticed that a lot of illegal settlements in the West Bank look like American suburban neighborhoods and stand out starkly in contrast to traditional Arab neighborhoods in both Palestine and the Middle East. Is this also a characteristic of colonial architecture? Yeah, I think it is in many ways because also quite simply, some of those settlers are Americans. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I mean, I don't know. It might be a little bit cyni a cynical thing to say, but I feel that uh, it, there was something quite interesting in the way um, you know Israel has always like pe like let's say Israeli liberals or or even like Israeli sim liberal sympathizers or something like that have been always arguing that. Um, uh, uh, Palestine, like occupied Palestine, is is widely different from a situation such as uh, such as Algeria, for example, because uh, you know Algeria used to be colonized by France, and then settlers could go back to France if they if they if they had to, which they did, but for for reasons that uh, were not uh, imposed by the Algerian National Liberation Front. But I mean, it's a it's a whole other story, but. Um, um, and and you know I don't think I don't think many of us contest anyway. Is that I mean are not really interested in talking about um, uh, about about um, a, about a free Palestine uh, that would not also include uh, Israelis who are willing to to live uh, on equal terms with uh, with uh, Palestinians. Uh, but it's interesting how there was there's always this discourse. And then when we talked about people who have been taken as hostages of uh, Hamas uh, in the past uh, in the past few weeks, then all of a sudden everybody became like Americans, French, and uh, British, and all these kind of things. So clearly, people have uh, many people, uh, many settlers also have like uh, uh, roots in uh, in uh, Western uh, Western countries. 
And I think, you know, when it comes to settlers in the West Bank, which again is a little bit more, uh, if you if you do consider international legislation as somewhat having an importance in this whole conversation, I think um, being a settler in the West Bank uh, is a pretty strong political act from uh, uh, any, any uh, Zionist uh, enactor. Some people, some people do it because it's the land is cheaper because it's even more stolen than the land on the west uh, on uh, on uh, in Israel. Uh, but then many people do it with a sort of a political agenda to uh, to annex uh, the West Bank uh, and uh, join it with uh, Israel. And many people who have this sort of like ideological uh, impetus, so to speak, are also people. Um, you know, who, who may have grew up somewhere else than in Palestine and who may have grew up in the U.S. in particular. So somehow they almost find their, their perfect uh, habitats indeed in those in those colonies that indeed look a lot like a, a, a U.S. Uh, sort of neighborhood. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I can say about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, with with this with this important spectrum of Europeanization, which again is not the Israeli society is not white in the way we we think of it usually, uh, 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 and uh, and you know it's very it's always important to understand the racial hierarchy within Israeli society itself between uh, Eastern European Hashkenazis, uh, uh, Northern African. Uh, um, uh, Sephardis and people who, who were uh, expelled from the Iber- from Iberia in 1492, like uh, the Spanish and Portuguese crown, like expelling uh, all Jewish people from Iberia, uh, and then um, the uh, Mizrahi Jewish uh, uh, from from Yemen, from Iraq, uh, uh, and who who are Arabophones for a lot of them, and uh, Ethiopian Jews. So there's there's an entire sort of stratification as well within the Israeli society uh, that is important to consider. But clearly, the the, the sort of dominant uh, racialized group is is the Ashkenazi one, and therefore, the fact that perhaps it looks like uh, an American neighborhood and Amer- the the U.S. being uh, itself a European col- settler colony created by uh, uh, very much uh, British, French, and Spanish uh, colonial powers bring us back to Europe and bring us back to this effort of Europeanization that also is expressed through architecture. Okay, there's another interesting question. Um, uh, Salma Ruby says, thanks for the presentation, your effort and time in speaking of memory and relation to space. How's the refugee camps and the new development uh, of Palestinian homes seen and considered? Uh, sorry. Uh, as a temporality in the Palestinian existence or new routes extended extended in their own land? I think, sorry, Fatma, can you repeat? Uh, as a temporality in the Palestinian existence or new routes extended in their own land. This is related to refugee camps and the new developments of Palestinian homes. Yeah, I mean, refugee camps are certainly not, you know, sometimes we... I think when it comes to Palestine, but I think it's the case in many in many settler colonies, but especially in in those that literally still have people who remember uh, before forty eight, before Zionism, and and all that. There is a tendency towards a form of nostalgia of pre colonial nostalgia, which in the case of Palestine usually tends to refer to pre forty eight nostalgia, which is. A little bit troubling, given that uh, 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 before Israel was uh, the British colonial uh, sovereignty, um, and then before that the Ottoman, even though that's a little bit different, of course. Um, but so nostalgia is is always something a little bit tricky, uh, and the architecture of Palestinian refugee camps could not be less uh, uh, nostalgic like they they don't have the luxury of being nostalgic they don't have the luxury of building some sort of like pseudo vernacular uh sort of architecture uh they're basically just like concrete slabs uh with posts and uh and you know there's this whole discourse as well on how the very architecture of the camp should always suggests the temporariness of it like the fact that everybody is always uh, uh is always aiming towards return 
and um, and so the architecture should suggest that the, the camp is temporary, and sometimes it's a little bit more the case than others. But I know that someone like Sandy Hilal is is has a very strong opinion on on the matter and says that says that she, they, they, like we should be able to to provide uh, an architecture that is uh, dignifying to Palestinian refugees, and uh, and this this is how. She and Alessandro Petit built a, a school in the Chuafat camp. Um, but so so I think I I but I, I really like this idea of I mean, you know, it's always it's also easy for me, like as a as a white French person to say like nostalgia, a pre pre-colonial nostalgia is is something we should fight against when perhaps because nostalgia does not necessarily touch a particularly emotional side of me when it very much might for a Palestinian person, for sure. But uh, but yeah, I suppose that something that is also proper to the architecture of Palestinian refugee camp is that it, it doesn't have that luxury. So I, I also find that quite compelling. OK, uh, I'll ask you a question from the YouTube chat, because sure. they're also asking a lot there as well. Sure. If Zohra Basha says, if architecture cannot be an apparatus for liberation or emancipatory, how can we as architects or students studying architecture utilize its spatial qualities for non-prescriptive means? I mean, I should preface my answer by saying that this is all my own very subjective uh, view of architecture that should not be... Uh, fascistic in the way that it imposes itself on everybody else, of course, uh, and that I tend to be a not so subtle person, not so nuanced person, and so therefore I I go with my big boots and say stuff like architecture can never be liberatory. But this is this is truly something I believe, meaning I believe architecture can serve the rev the revolution, if we may say it in overly simplistic terms like this one. Uh, but it it doesn't serve the revolution in a way that you know a colonized person would enter an architecture and then become decolonized. Like it, it doesn't exist. It doesn't. Whereas a, a person might enter uh, a building and become a prisoner. It's called a prison. And by the way, this is also a massively massive absence of this presentation. Also because you know. Uh, I think it was Youssef asking, like, how can I take those photos? I think it would be a little bit more complicated to take photos of uh, a prison, an Israeli military prison. Um, uh, despite, despite, I mean, also because of this rule of using my own document, although I'm, I'm very happy to, um, uh, to oppose to the key as not the key of return, but the key as the one that. Uh, close uh, that that crystallize the political order of settler colonial architecture. I'm very happy to oppose it. Uh, the spoon, uh, the spoon that allowed uh, six Palestinian prisoners in in uh, 2021 to escape from the Israeli military prison in which they were imprisoned uh, by digging a tunnel. And for me, that's also um, uh, that's something I was literally just teaching to my students uh, in Los Angeles yesterday uh, uh, in how the spoon allows for um, allow if if we if we reach a scale of time that is sufficiently long and usually that's the scale of time of liberation and that's the scale of time of people in prison if we reach that scale of time sufficiently long, then a spoon can become an instrument of liberation from the from colonial architecture, um, as as we've seen it, um, and and as such became like a symbol of Palestinian resistance as well, like the spoon, like this very tiny object. Um, and to me, that's that's truly inspiring. But then, as architects, to actually design buildings that uh, would be emancipatory for me, that doesn't exist, but then that would serve part of what the revolution is trying to do. Uh, that's another That's another topic. I, I, I think, I, I just think that uh, architecture is always an instrument of, of control of some sort or, or, or protection, but quite often the protection is, is the protection of the powerful. 
And then what does that mean for us to, to design, to protect the, the not powerful, those who are on the other, on the receiving end of architecture's violence usually is another question, but it's something that I think it's very important if, if I leave architecture students with one uh, sort of more general uh, consideration, something to consider would be to think that architecture is always more it's so easy for architecture to embody an oppressive uh, political regime. It is much harder. It it requires so much. I mean, you know, some of you might be in the U.S. Here is like, uh, you you literally have an architectural, a colonial architectural operation that became a three word slogan for a fascistic uh, a presidential campaign. Like, build that wall. That's three words that led to a fascistic presidency in, in the settler colony we call the United States of America. Uh, that is an architectural action. That's how easy it is to conceptualize a settler colonial architecture. Whereas to think of an architect, an anti-colonial architecture requires a hell lot more of, of, of thinking and humbling and um i i believe also community service in many ways as architects but as as a as a humble uh as humble architects acting in their capacity of architects just like everybody else is acting in capacity of a nurse or a teacher or uh, a fighter or something Okay, uh, there's an interesting question about, but it's anonymous, so I'm not sure who to attend uh, to address. Uh, but what are the conditions on which Palestinians can actually build when the Isra when Israel controls what materials that come in and out, and how do they enact that control? Because that person said they remember seeing somewhere online how Palestinians depend on recycling the rubbles from destroyed buildings. Yeah, so that would be Gaza specifically. Uh, well, quite simply, cement is uh, is forbidden to enter Gaza. So many buildings that were destroyed uh, in 2014 by the bombings have not been rebuilt, uh, and and the only cement that is that can be brought in is brought through the tunnels, and um, and this is going to be a this is going to be a massive question for the months and years to come uh, and some things that should be um, very much you know as much as i of course agree that we need to demand a ceasefire i feel like it should be a ceasefire also with um uh, the end of the blockade but even you know it's it's always like the sort of uh the different horizon of the liberatory struggles like of course liberation is the ultimate is the ultimate goal but then blocking the blocking the blockade is uh, dismantling the blockade. It should be uh, uh, one that is a little bit closer to us, and then allowing the blockade to uh, to enter like the many many medical need that will be needed and the instrument of reconstruction is to me uh, very crucial. But at the same time, it's it's if if it is. If it is not coming from a, a balance, a balancing of power, uh, that a massive worldwide solidarity with Palestinians would would force uh, the state of Israel to obey, rather than something left to their goodwill. Of course, it's never going to happen, and uh, and that's why calibrating the way we demand things is 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 absolutely crucial. And. And on that, I might I might have to stop it here because there's over a hundred questions, and I thought I I think like keeping it in two hours is actually probably a reasonable thing to do. But I'm I'm very grateful to everyone who've been here today and everyone who's been spreading the news and in particular everyone who've organized a uh, uh, collective viewing in architecture schools or in other organization in in Tunis in Turkey in. Norway, in London, in the US, in Canada, uh, and maybe some in some places and in France and in places I, I don't I'm not even aware of. So this is uh, this is truly beautiful. So thank you for for doing that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Leopold Lambert, um, for this very insightful and uh, informative talk, timely uh, talk as well.
Uh, and thank you for sharing your research and uh, some uh, on-ground um, uh, photos and, and maps. Um, we It's been a, a true honor and a pleasure to host your talk. And we would like everyone to stay tuned for our uh, remaining days in architecture. We have um, several lectures and events uh, at AUC, uh, at American University in, Camp, uh, uh, in Cairo. So please join us in person if you're around. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a, thank you, Leo. a lovely evening, night, <laughs> afternoon, morning. You too. Bye. Bye.